It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Glenn R. Hansen, DDS, PhD. He received his DDS from UCLA in 73 and his PhD in pharmacology from the University of Utah in 78 and completed a fellowship in neuropharmacology in 1980 at the National Institutes of Health, NIH, Bethesda, Maryland. He practiced dentistry full and part-time over a 10-year period. He is a tenured full professor of pharmacology and vice dean in the School of Dentistry. He was the acting director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse at the National Institute of Health and recognized as a leading expert on the neurobiology of the psychostimulants, uh, stimulants as uppers. Dr. Hansen has given several hundred presentations around the world on his research and program development related to drug abuse and the public health implications. He has also testified multiple times before the United States Congress and the state of Utah legislator on issues of drug abuse policy and Medicaid dental strategies and is frequently interviewed by local and international press about these topics. He is a member of the state of Utah Legislative Advisory Committee on Drugs of Abuse He's the author of over 240 peer-reviewed scientific papers, 13 editions of a textbook entitled Drugs in Society, and has been awarded over $35 million in NIH uh, National Institute of Health grants to, to conduct research related to drug abuse and its treatment. Dr. Hansen has recently been involved in studying the effects of including comprehensive dental care as part of the treatment uh, for substance use disorder. And it was a really interesting article um, that caught my eye um, where, um, where was it, where the, um, it was all over social media, uh, just this um, May 21st, 2019, dental care helps drug abuse patients recover. The study showed that drug abuse patients who consulted dental professionals for major oral health problems stayed in treatment almost two times longer and then they quote yours truly, this is a powerful synergy between oral health care and substance use disorder, said Glenn Hansen, the study's first author and professor at the University of Utah. Dr. Hansen, thank you so much for coming on this show today. It's this my is, pleasure. It's such a controversial subject. It seems to be so emotional. And I can tell by your, the words you use, um, how you have a PhD, like you call it, um, you don't call it substance abuse. You call it, what do you call it? Substance use disorder. Substance use disorder. So um, it seems like, um, I just want to start this in a little perspective. It seems like when I got out of school in 87, um, the media said the doctors were the bad guy because there's grandma suffering from cancer. She had surgery. They won't give her any pain pills. And we were the bad guys. So right. we started giving them the, the pain pills. And right. then the pendulum swung all the way to the other side. Now they're like, well, you naughty little boy, look what you did to grandma. Right. Now she's a, she's a heroin addict. And how do, you, um, how do you gauge between you need this opioid for pain, but I don't want this to ruin your life, and you become addicted to it? Well, I, th I think it's one, you have to train the provider, the one who writes the prescription, the one who assesses the risk on the part of the patient. And to start off with, they have to understand what substance use disorder really is. Uh, most people know it as addiction, but it's referred to now as SUD. Uh, SUD is defined in the DSM-5 manual. And the DSM-5 manual, these manuals are used for psychiatrists and mental health workers to diagnose mental health disorders. And there's about 150, 200 pages of this manual that talk just about drug abuse. And so in this last edition, they decided not to refer to it as dependence or addiction, but to call it substance use disorder. So that's why you hear that new nomenclature in the last few years because of this this uh, switch in term that came out of the DSM-5 manual. But that's what it's referring to basically is what most of us think of as far as addiction. So providers need to know what the difference is between drug dependence, drug abuse, and substance use disorder or addiction. So forgive me if I use those two interchangeably because I – I want to make sure that your uh, listening audience is aware of its addiction we're talking about. But providers need to know that there's a difference between these three phenomena. 
And the three were drug dependence, drug abuse, and... And drug and uh, substance use disorder or addiction. Interesting. Now, um, I've, I've been hearing more and more that um, if you have uh, a drug issue, <laughs> I'm not, I don't have a PhD in this, so I might just call them all uh, drug issues. Please, but, go but, ahead. But if you have a drug dependence, drug abuse, substance use disorder, that at least, you know, 80% of these people have an underlying mental uh, disease, uh, mental disorder. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? I, I, I really disagree with it uh, just because it is so distinct according to the individual. All substance use disorder does not look the same. It's kind of like a cancer. You know, sometimes we say, oh, yeah, my friend has cancer. Well, cancer isn't cancer isn't cancer isn't cancer because there's so many different forms and it works very differently in different people. And substance use disorder is the same way. It's a very individual uh, phenomena. And so risk looks different. Environment looks different. Uh, there are those who would claim that even those who have very low risk for substance use disorder, if you put them in the right environment, high stress, uh, very, uh, uh, very threatening where there's a lot of, of tension, a lot of demands placed on you and a very low self-image that you are still vulnerable to substance use disorder. So it's the environment and it is also the risk, the natural genetic risk, and it may be the disease. There are some diseases where, like neurodegenerative diseases, where there's damage done to the brain. It could be, da it could be done because of an accident, a car accident, the damage to piece of your brain, or it could be a pathology like a, a Parkinson's disease or an Alzheimer's disease that makes you more susceptible to problems with drugs than when you were younger. So it's a time of life that could also have an impact as to whether you're suffering issues with SUD. So there is nobody that is immune under the right kind of circumstances to having these kinds of problems with uh, these substances. Humans are extremely complex, aren't they? They very um, much are. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm convinced at age 57 that I'm the only normal person on earth. <laughs> well, that sounds like a mental. <laughs> <laughs> Have I just diagnosed myself? Um, I think dentist, so. <laughs> dentistry is always in the news about opioids. Like, um, um, this just recently opioids unnecessary for dental work doc says right. the American dental association recently reported dentistry is responsible for prescribing 12% of all instant release opioids. Dr. Mojam Farjam DDS of Sutton advanced cosmetic dentistry talked to Fox news. Um, it's, it's a tough call because, uh, well, let's just talk wisdom teeth. It seems like that's the procedure the news talks about the most. Little Billy came in, he's 18, he got his four wisdom teeth removed. Doctor routinely gave Vicodin, and now there's a problem. Um, so, And then the ADA is even saying that the dentist prescribed 12% of uh, instant release opioids. Is is that too? Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts about dentists and opioids? Well, I would say that uh, the dental profession has sort of a unique niche in this big problem. Uh, I've, I've testified, I've been an expert witness, I've been involved in committees, both at the national and the local level, discussing this issue. Who are the providers? Uh, who are the individuals that we need to really focus our attention on in providing education so that they're involved in the solution and they're not involved in causing the problem. And when dentistry comes up, almost without exception for those who know, I mean, who really know what's going on here, they see them as a piece of the puzzle. Usually they are used by individuals who have SUD as a means of filling a void of getting access to drugs for a short period of time. So like over the weekend, for whatever reason, they've run out of their opioid or they don't have access to their supply. Maybe they're out of town. 
Uh, and so they go to a dentist on a Friday afternoon when he or she is just about to close. And they say, oh, I've got this terrible root canal uh, problem. It hurts so bad. Uh, is there any way you can give me a, just a small prescription? Get me over the weekend. I'll be here Monday. Well, the dentist wants to go home, uh, doesn't know the patient, accepts them at their word. Maybe they're dressed well. They look like, oh, they shouldn't be having an SUD problem. Writes the prescription, gives them 10, 15. If he's really generous, he gives him 20. So they get these, they use them to carry them over until they can find the main source of their drug where they're getting hundreds of tablets. They're not just getting 10 or 15. So they use the dental professionals as a means to, to hold them over until they can get access to the big numbers. Very rarely do you see dentists uh, prescribing hundreds of these opioids, which are necessary in order to maintain an SUD uh, person. Uh, they're rarely the ones that are doing that. They're, they're there, they're contributing, but usually they don't start it uh, and they also don't end it, uh, and they just kind of contribute in the middle, kind of, they're just sort of ignorant as to what's going on around them, and they write their little prescription, and, and the SUD patient goes on his or her way. Um, when, when you say their source, um, I hear other people, this is, um, you know, th there's many, many different uh, opinions and angles on this, but a lot of people say that when um, when you look at the opioid deaths, I mean, and, and they're they're so high. I mean, they're incredibly high. A lot of people say that that's a side effect of them being illegal. That if they bought the opioid, like say Vicodin or hydrocodone at Walgreens, it wouldn't have been cut with fentanyl, and that when it's illegal and they drive to underground illegal manufacturing of opioids, the way they're made is a big part of the um, of the opioid death. Do you think, um, how do you wrap your mind around the pros and cons of it being illegal so thus they buy illegal drugs cut with, you know, other right. things versus at least if they were legal, you would know a high quality laboratory made the opioid. So there certainly is a fraction of individuals who uh, overdose and die because there's some fentanyl or something else that they've used to cut the, the medication. These are gonna be illegals. You're not gonna get these from the pharmacy. You're not gonna get them because of a prescription, but you're gonna get it because you went to the street for whatever reason, and it may be that your prescriber, usually a physician or a PA, uh, your prescriber says, enough is enough. I'm really concerned you're getting too much, so I'm gonna cut back. I'm not gonna provide you with this stuff anymore. And so they have to look elsewhere to satisfy the, the addiction and they go to the street and then they take something that has fentanyl in it. So there are some deaths that come from this, but they're the minority. The majority of people who overdose on opioids usually have multiple drugs in their system. They have a prescription opioid in their system, either an oxycodone, maybe a, uh, morphine or they have uh, a mepiridine or it could be a hydrocodone. Uh, I mean, there's a variety of drugs that they could be taken. Uh, it, it could even be methadone. It could be part of the treatment where they were using methadone to help them get off heroin and they were using it legally, but they mixed it with other stuff. So these folks, and I've been an expert witness on a number of these locally and nationally, and in every case that I worked on, there are at least three other drugs in the system. Usually there was alcohol in it. There was 60% uh, of the time there's a benzodiazepine in it, like a Valium drug. And then there is an over-the-counter or a common kind of drug in there, either an antihistamine that they're using to try to get to sleep. Sometimes they have, uh, they have congestion and they're using the antihistamine, or they have muscles that are jumpy and they're using a muscle relaxant like a Soma. So that's in there. So there's three or four, and then now we're seeing more and more as medical marijuana or recreational marijuana is becoming available. They have THC in their system as well. 
So they've got three or four CNS depressants, an opioid is one of them, and they're working together and they typically die in their sleep. So they also have natural physiological CNS depression because of the sleep. They usually die about two or three in the morning. Somebody comes in the next morning and tries to wake them up and they can't wake them up because they have succumbed overnight. So it's not just opioids, although opioids is a critical piece of the discussion. It's other things that are happening in their life that they're trying to address other than just pain. Yeah, I mean, there's been some very high profiles. Uh, everything you were saying remind me of um, the Whitney Houston case. Uh, there were right. multiple things found in her bloodstream. Typical. Yeah. Um, do you think the um, Do you think the legalization? Another um, very controversial part is the legalization of marijuana. We're seeing that roll across the state. Do you think that will? Um, make some people leave the harder stuff like opioids and do something uh, less toxic or less um, lethal like marijuana? Or what is your view of this wave of marijuana legalization? Absolutely not. I don't believe that for a second. And I've worked in this field for 40 years now, and I've testified before the drug czar and before the administration when I was back at uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse. And at that time, this was in 2001, 2002, we were very concerned about marijuana. The drug czar uh, had decided that they, as their, as their focus, they were going to use a campaign to try to discourage marijuana use. And so they asked me to come and explain to the drug czar and their organization, the DEA, about marijuana and what does it look like and what are my concerns about uh, the marijuana discussion and marijuana as a drug or as a group of drugs, because marijuana is a plant. It's got a lot of stuff in it and it represents a category of drugs we call the cannabinoids. So the active ingredient in marijuana is THC, tetrahydrocannabinoid. A lot of us have heard about CBD, which is cannabidiol, but it's also kind of a cannabinoid that's related to THC. So there's a family of these drugs that are out there. And people tend to think, oh, marijuana is what we're talking about. We're really not talking about marijuana. We're talking about a category of drugs uh, that have different properties, but they have some similarities as well. So what does that mean in terms of the medical discussion? Is there a place for marijuana in treating disorders. I, I don't know if marijuana is the best uh, example of what we want to use, but there will be cannabinoid drugs that will give us selectivity and allow us to access body symptoms that will be useful and are being useful in treating disease. My big problem with marijuana, one is the plant, why do you want to use a plant that has all kinds of hundreds of chemicals that we know nothing about as a means to introduce THC, which is the drug you're really after? I mean, this doesn't even make medical sense. And then to think you're going to be able to control things such as dose, control self-administration when you've got a drug that is a very potent drug, works with a lot of different systems, it has a really bad profile in people who have mental health problems. Everybody accepts this. If you take marijuana and you've got underlying problems such as psychosis or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or affective disorder, this drug can cause great harm to these people. Well, 50 to 60% of the users uh, recreationally and prescription have underlying mental health disorders. So we're giving the drug to the very people that it's most likely to create side effects in. So it's just, it's a, it's a piece of stick of dynamite. We've lit the fuse and now we're going to sit back and see what happens with it as use patterns change because people will start using it more and more and more and more, just like tobacco. You know, tobacco wasn't all that toxic 
when people only smoked once or twice a day, it's when they got up to the two and three packs a day that we realized what a uh, toxic substance this is. We'll see the same thing. I have no doubt we'll see the same thing with marijuana. As you start to get people who are smoking it as much as individuals smoke tobacco, they'll do the same kinds of stuff. It'll damage the lungs. It'll have problems. It could cause cancers. It'll have mental problems. It'll alter neurological systems. And then we're really, really concerned about adolescent use. We know there's good literature out there that says adolescents that use this while they're developing have a very high incidence of problems, uh, long-term, if not permanent problems. But 90% of the first-time users of t uh, marijuana are adolescents. It always has been that way. Even when it was illegal, 90% of the, uh, the first-time users are adolescents. Why do we think this will change if we make it legal or if we make it medical and the uh, adolescents say, oh, this can't hurt me. This has been approved by physicians and the medical community. This can only do me good and it's going to attract them to using uh, this drug even more. I mean, that's one thing we've, we've learned time and time again, not just with, just with marijuana, but with every drug. Tobacco is the same way. Alcohol is the same way that adolescents are more interested in these drugs than adults are. And so whatever you do in terms of making access easier for these compounds, you better always ask the question, what is this going to do to an already, already big problem with uh, high adolescent use of these substances? And are we ready to deal with this for the next 20 and 30 and 40 years while these folks grow up? after bringing their brains up under the influence of marijuana. What, what do you think of um, a child's um, future when, say, from 12 to 22, um, they've been smoking marijuana daily? Well, one thing we already know, and, and these are hard studies to do because it's hard to get an IRB, an Institutional Review Board, to approve giving an adolescent uh, marijuana three times a day while they grow up. I mean, <laughs> OIRB is going to do this. So all, <clears throat> so all you can do is retrospective studies and go back and see if I can find somebody out there who self-reports that they used it at a certain rate over the, the, the growth or during their developmental period. So it, it, it's retrospective and the self-report. But still, we know, we know that if they are exposed frequently, they, there will be a very high incidence of addiction. We know that. It'll be very hard for them to get off of the marijuana, just like tobacco. When you use tobacco early on, or alcohol, you use them early on, the brain changes its neurochemistry because it sees substances that are active and it'll alter the way those pathways form. So now it's used to seeing it when they're it's adults. They expect it almost as though it's a natural substance. They expect it, and you try to come and take it away. The brain does not like that because you've disrupted a homeostasis of the brain that had developed throughout its adolescent period. And they'll have withdrawals. They'll be uh, really high cravings and motivation to use it. It'll be very hard to get them off of it. Um, some people in dentistry are reporting that um, the cannabis users need more anesthesia for surgery. Are you s noticing that? I, I could see why that could be the case. Uh, here again, we're in an area that has not been well studied. We think that the cannabinoid receptors, these are the targets for things like THC or other uh, substances related to the, to the THC, we know that some of them are involved in pain modulation. And so if you are a user, there's one thing we know about uh, marijuana and that is it causes tolerance. And all of the CNS depressants do this. Alcohol does it, the benzodiazepines do it, the opioids do it, and marijuana does it. They all cause tolerance so that the systems adjust if you use these drugs over and over and over again, which means if you want to maintain the effect, you have to increase the dose. So as tolerance occurs, 
your dosing increases, you either have to take the substance more often or you've got to find a more potent substance out there, which is already happening with marijuana. The percent of, of active ingredients in marijuana is two to three times higher than we've ever seen it in the past. So we're already cultivating higher, more potent marijuana. And some of this is because people are using it more and more and more, and they want the effect. And in order to do that, you need a more potent substance. It's like going from a hydrocodone to a oxycodone to a fentanyl. You know, the hydrocodone doesn't work anymore. It doesn't control anymore. So you bump up to the next potency and then you go to the next potency. Well, what do we do with uh, marijuana? What we do is we smoke more and we cultivate it so that the ingredient, active ingredient is higher, a higher percentage, which also means it's more likely to cause side effects, which is again, what we're having a problem with our opioids because we're much more concerned about having fentanyl, very high potency, easy to kill people with fentanyl, than we are with hydrocodone. Doesn't mean we're not concerned about hydrocodone because we certainly are. But anytime fentanyl comes into the discussion, we all get really excited because we know it only takes micrograms to kill people with fentanyl. It takes hundreds of milligrams to kill people with hydrocodone. Well, we're seeing the same phenomena. I'm not saying we've got a fentanyl cannabinoid out there, although I'm also not saying that someday we may not find one. But we do see that we're getting higher potencies of the products. We don't have really good control over the cultivation of these products. So coming back to your question about pain, it is, if you're using it a lot, it's going to mess up with a lot of systems that have a cannabinoid element to them. And to the extent that pain has a cannabinoid element, you may be developing tolerance to that part of the pain pathway. And so when you come and try to use traditional, whether it's opioid or aspirin or acetaminophen or ibuprofen, you find out you need more of it because it's developed, a piece of its pain pathway has become tolerant. It's not as sensitive as it once was because it's been seeing this, seeing this drug over and over again. So you got to compensate by increasing the doses of these other drugs in order to control the path. Does that make sense? It does. Uh, you're very uh, profound. Um, there's a big um, <clears throat> history. I wonder what you what lessons we've learned from history. Uh, um, Samuel Johnson used to say the uh, the chains of habit are too weak to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. And um, the opium wars in China, I mean, those were from 1839 to 1860. So it, it would be hard to say this is a new problem. Oh, it's 19- not. <laughs> yeah. So, what, what, uh, so it's not a new problem, is it? No, it's not a new problem. And yet we're not any smarter at addressing it. We think we're fairly uh, sophisticated. Oh, we know the pharmacology. We know the molecular biology. We know there's genetics, we know this, we know that, we know the other. And yet uh, there are still people who are dying from overdoses. There are still uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of people who get addicted. The addiction is a little different. I mean, in those ancient days, the Chinese days or the other societies that that could cultivate the, the marijuana poppies or the opium poppies, they, for the most part, were either self-administering or they had some herbal herbalist uh, that would provide the raw material for them. Whereas today we have doctors and dentists and other prescribers who can give it to them. And hopefully they're better trained at recognizing someone who's got a substantial risk potential And so they're careful and they manage and they watch closely and they warn their patients and they tell them how to avoid problems with it in a better way than they did anciently. But I'm not sure we're all that much better in terms of outcomes. It doesn't seem like we're any better at at preventing severe addiction or preventing overdoses and and terrible tragedies with these substances. Um, 
what lessons do you think we should have learned from uh, China? I mean, we're coming up on 2020, so 200 years ago, China's one fifth of the world's population. What do you think? Um, what What do you think the main takeaway lesson is from the uh, um, Opium Wars? Well, it, years ago? It, the history of the Opium Wars, to the extent that I that I understand it, is that that uh, Britain who had lost a lot of its access to tea uh, tax revenue, was looking for a substitute and they came across opium from China. I mean, tea came from China, and so they had already engaged in, uh, in commercial transactions with China and they said, well, let's shift from tea, let's go to another product and let's work on the opium that you're producing and, and you don't really want to produce it. You're trying to control it. So give it to us and we'll distribute it for you and make a lot of money on it. And this went on for a while and, and Britain did make a lot of money. And then China said, no, we just can't do this anymore. This is too destructive to our society. We want to stop this. And Britain said, no, 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 you can't stop it. This is making a lot of money for our, our nation. And so that's where they went to war, Britain said, no, you have to give us and provide us uh, this substance, whether they had contracts or whatever. And China said, no, we don't want to be the opium source for the rest of the world. And they ended up fighting it and Britain gets Hong Kong and, and a bunch of other things. But I, I think it illustrates where a society that is examining its problems carefully comes to the conclusion that enough is enough. We have got to put a stop to this. We can't let it take its natural course. We have to intervene and try to restrict its access because it's going to hurt our society. Uh, it already has, and it's going to hurt it even more. And they were willing to go to war in order to change that pathway around. I think we should look at them and say, China figured it out. They figured it how destructive it was to their society. Maybe we need to look at ourselves and see if we haven't been the providers of some of these opioid products uh, through our pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and maybe we need to step back and take a more responsive position as far as providing this stuff, controlling it, uh, and making sure that people understand and the vulnerable are protected from its, uh, its addictive consequences. Um there's a lot of high profile trials over um, companies manufacturing the opioids. There are. Uh, do you think those are um, well deserved, or do you think um, um, people are? What, what are what are your thoughts on those trials? I would say yes and no. I I actually am fairly familiar with some of them just because of of where I came from uh, and my addiction background and my expertise and, and people have talked to me and asked for opinions and that sort of stuff. Uh, I don't think that there are any innocents here, but I don't think uh, that there is a, a company that is so guilty that we want to totally drum it out of business and bankrupt it. Uh, I'm, it seems like everybody should take some responsibility it's not just the company's fault. The company's trying to make a product, and, and early on, uh, they were probably merchandising some of these products, particularly the sustained release ones, uh, with not fully understanding the potential of the addiction and the consequences. Uh, from what I know and what I've seen, once they started to realize what was going on, they tried to correct and they tried to create forms and products that couldn't be abused in the same way the original ones by putting substances in the sustained release uh, products so that uh, the addict wouldn't be tempted to solubilize it, extract the Oxycontin out and inject it. So, I mean, they were anxious to prevent addiction and I think they did things to try to prevent uh, that addiction. Um, a lot of people are saying that there's no need for an opioid in dentistry, that um, they often quote that if you alternate Tylenol 
um, with uh, aspirin every four hours, that that was, you know, that that's even better than an opioid. Other people say, well, there's no clinical trials on that. Um, mm -hmm. If someone said to you, there's no need for opioids in dentistry, period, end of story, implants, wisdom teeth, root canals, well, how would you answer that? Would you agree, disagree? I, I would say that if used properly, the opioids, it's a tool. I mean, all of these things are tools and all of them have side effects. You know how many people we kill with aspirin every year because they bleed out or they have ulcers, perforated ulcers. I mean, aspirin, when it's not used properly, can be a very damaging, toxic drug. What about acetaminophen? You know, there are a lot of people who die from liver failure if they use too much acetaminophen. And we hadn't, we didn't know this for a long time. And now anybody that has underlying liver problems, whether they have a hepatitis history or if they're an alcohol consumer, they probably should not be using much acetaminophen because of the liver toxicity. So every one of these things has potential side effects. So you gotta do, you need to do a benefit risk assessment. One, you need to look at the type of pain that's going to result. Is it inflammatory pain? If it's inflammatory, then a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug is probably the better drug. Uh, opioids can block that, but they don't do anything for the inflammation. So you may get two fours with the NSAIDs, anti-inflammation as well as some analgesic. How severe is the pain going to be? Where is the pain coming from? If it is a pain that's associated with the teeth or with the bone or with the uh, gingiva, these are, are tissues that respond fairly well to the insets. If it's a pain that's coming from inside, if it's coming from, let's say, the sinus or it's coming from internal structures, they don't respond as well to NSAIDs and opioids would probably be a better option. But regardless of which of the ones you choose in terms of how severe is it, the more severe, I can get better analgesia with morphine than you'll ever get with ibuprofen, acetaminophen, aspirin, or a combination thereof. It's because, IV, or it's because opioids work at three different levels of the pain pathway. The anti-inflammatories work at one, maybe two, and those are peripheral. Opioids tend to be more centrally, more in the spinal cord, and even up into the brain and the higher level structures. So they do, and they work at different places. Sometimes the best thing is to combine them. I mean, this is actually a nice synergistic uh, combination. If you, if you get uh, a hydrocodone and you combine it with acetaminophen, or a hydrocodone and you combine it with, a C, uh, with an aspirin, uh, you can get the best of both worlds and you don't have to use high doses of either one. So that combination is, is actually something that was taught a lot when I went to dental school uh, and I, I taught in medical school and we taught the physicians the same thing and we teach our, our dental students now that same thing. So it's not like, well, throw those all away because they're causing us problems today and we'll embrace these until they start causing us problems and then we'll throw those away and then we'll go back to the old ones. And you kind of referred to that when you talked about the days when we said, uh, if people hurt, we shouldn't be letting them hurt. We need to give them opioids to uh, control it. And then we started to get the abuse and the deaths and, and the pendulum swung in the other way. And we said, oh, we shouldn't be using opioids. We should just use all of the NSAIDs. And it swings back and forth and back and forth. And we just have to use our information. We know what these things look like. We know what the side effects look like. We know what causes the side effects. If we're just prescribing and sending our patients home and expecting them to figure all this out on their own, then I don't care what drug you give them, uh, there's going to be problems. We've got to be engaged. We have to be talking. We've got to know what their histories are and then decide which are the most appropriate drugs for the target, the objective, and for the background of our patients. So you graduated from dental school. Uh, you went to UCLA. 
And right. now you're sitting in a, um, according to the news, uh, a new $36 million building. Uh, you made the newspaper University of Utah celebrates new $36 million dental school building. Um, tell us about the new dental school and how is it different uh, than UCLA back in the day? So UCLA was great. <laughs> and although they don't, their football's not so good. University of Utah's football is better. But anyway, uh, it is a, it's a different time. Uh, and this new school has given us the opportunity to look at the dentistry and its curriculum and particularly its relevance to the other primary care uh, providers and comprehensive, when we talk about comprehensive health and comprehensive care, what role does oral health play in that uh, whole discussion? And so as uh, dental school at the University of Utah, we are part of the University of Utah healthcare system. So we work very closely with primary care providers. Uh, we have several offsite clinics throughout the state of Utah, and those clinics, for the most part, have dentistry and primary care working shoulder to shoulder. And so the physicians or the PAs or the nurses, they'll see something, they'll notice that there's an oral health issue and they'll bring the patients across the hall to us uh, in dentistry or to the hygienist. Or we see something in our patients and we can just walk across the hall and take it to uh, the medical care providers. We work very closely together and, and we're starting to find that not only by working closely together do we serve the patient better, but we also find that we complement each other in terms of our medical slash dental objectives. I don't, think it, I don't think anybody would be surprised looking in the mirror to, to realize that the mouth is part of the rest of the body. Uh, unfortunately, we sometimes practice as though it is. We practice in a silo and we say, oh, no, 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 we don't want to go anywhere further back in the mouth because that's really not our purview, that's somebody else's or, or the maxillofacial or primary care or, or pediatrician don't want to come into the mouth because they feel like, oh, no, that's totally off, uh, off base for us. We shouldn't be going there. We should be having these discussions uh, amongst ourselves as to, what we can contribute, what they can contribute to us, and vice versa. And this kind of gets to a, a study that we had recently. We called it uh, the FLOSS study. Uh, FLOSS is an acronym for a grant we got from HRSA, the Health uh, Resource Services Administration, to study what happens when you provide comprehensive dental care to patients who are being treated for substance use disorder. So this is kind of the issue that I'm referring to, that we shouldn't be treating their conditions as, oh, these are totally separate, they're not associated with each other, but rather you should be treating them as though they're complementing each other and that you can get better outcomes in both areas if you treat both things together. And so as I think most dentists or health uh, oral health providers know, that people that have substance use disorder generally many of them have major oral health problems which aggravate all of the difficulties they're wrestling with as part of their SUD problems. They're not employed, they're unemployed, they have very poor self-confidence, uh, they withdraw, they're isolated, uh, they feel as though they're total failures, uh, they're in total despair. Many of them contemplate things such as suicide because they don't see that there's any light at the end of this tunnel and there's no way that they can manage it or they can conquer it. And so they just let their mouths uh, go untreated. Some of the drugs they, they treat cause xerostomia. They do damage to the mouths and this worsens uh, that condition. They can't eat. They've lost dentition. They hurt all the time because they've got infections. They've got root canals that need to be done. Uh, they can't sleep at night. So malnourished, uh, terrible self-image, they don't have any work, socially, uh, out, social outcasts, and a lot of this is coming out of the mouth and the things that have happened to the mouth. And so we thought maybe if we could put these two areas together as part of therapy, 
that you would get better outcomes in treating the substance use disorder. So we did that, and that's this grant, Floss Grant, uh, gave us the wherewithal to do it. So we took 300 patients, uh, had major SUD problems, and they had major oral health problems as well. Almost half of them were heroin, so a really high proportion were heroin. Uh, about 30% were meth, methamphetamine, about 10, 20% were alcoholics, about 10% were marijuana, and then the rest of them were odds and ends of other kinds of drugs. Very few of them were single drug users. I mean, it's unusual to find someone who has a major substance use disorder and they're only focusing on one drug. Most of them are poly substance abusers, but they had their, they had their primary drug. And so we identified the primary drug. So we brought them in, took care, and this was comprehensive dental, and it wasn't just emergencies. I mean, we certainly took care of the emergency issues, but we wanted to restore their mouths in the same way that any of us going into a dentist's office would expect. So they got the full complement. The only thing we wouldn't or couldn't do for these patients was uh, implants. But we did everything else. We did restorative, we did periodontics, we did endodontics, we did all the oral surgery, uh, we did uh, uh, crown and bridge, we did removable, we did everything that they needed. So at the end of the day, after the treatment, they walked out of that office and the mouth was back where it should be. We had this great big mirror as they, as they could walk out of the where the clinic was into the waiting room, there's this big mirror and most of them would stop at the mirror once the dental work was done and just give this great big smile. They would look at the mirror and see what had happened, uh, the transfiguration that had occurred to them. So we thought, well, this looks like this is really working well. So we went to the SUD providers, the ones who are uh, that were uh, managing them and uh, providing care for their substance use disorder. We said, what, what does this look like in terms of other aspects of SUD? I mean, they look like they're feeling a lot better about themselves when they're coming out after we've taken care of the oral health piece. So they went and they looked at their outcome assessments. And this is when we found a dramatic effect in terms of SUD treatment outcomes. They stayed in treatment two to three times longer. The average treatment duration for major uh, substance use disorder like heroin abuse or meth abuse was about uh, three months, 100 days. If they were getting comprehensive dental care, it, was, it approached a year. So it went up dramatically. We found out that employment went up dramatically. When they left, they were two to three times more likely to be employed if they had comprehensive dental care than if they didn't have comprehensive dental care. They were two to three times more likely to get off of their primary drug of abuse, so they were, were much more likely to become abstinent. And if they had had a history of homelessness before they came into treatment, if they got comprehensive dental care, literally homelessness disappeared. When they left, they left their SUD treatment and they finished the dental care, they had a home, they had a place to go, they did not go back on the streets or under the viaducts, so homelessness disappeared. You, you, go ahead. Where, where did you get the word FLOSS participants? What, what did you say FLOSS stood for? Facilitating uh, a lifetime, FLOSS, facilitating a lifetime of oral health sustainability for substance use disorder patients and families. That's it. I never remember it. That's why I always call it floss. But, but if, if you tease those words out, it, that's kind of what it's talking about. It's talking about what does it mean when you take care of their oral health needs? Uh, what does it mean as far as their substance use problem in a long-term way? And our data suggests that it means a lot. It really helps. And these where, where, where is that study? Is that um, published? The That's in the Journal of American Dental Association. It's oh, okay. a July okay. issue of this year, 2000 okay. or yeah, 2019. Yep. Got it. Got it. Um, yes. Comprehensive oral care. I was just trying to connect the floss term. C comprehensive oral care improves treatment outcomes in male and female patients with high severity and chronic substance uh, use disorder. It, it is just such a complex issue, isn't it? 
It, it, it totally is. And, and when I talk to people about this, I've talked to dental groups and, and I've also talked to the Medicaid organizations across the country. I mean, one of the outcomes of this, because the effects were so dramatic, we took them to the state legisla legislature and uh, we said, we think that if we could provide comprehensive dental care to Medicaid patients who have uh, substance use disorder issues, they're being treated, and we couple comprehensive dental care with that through the Medicaid program, we're gonna see the same kinds of outcomes in our Medicaid uh, population. And we got it through the legislature almost unanimously. The Medicaid office said, yes, let's do it. The federal Medicaid office, when we sent a request to have it part of the federal Medicaid program, they called us and said, we've never heard of this before. Would you explain this to us as to what you're talking about? And we said, sure. That uh, we invited them to come to the dental school and we'd show them. They came, they spent an afternoon with us and we had some floss patients down in our clinic that we were taking care of that day. We took them down, introduced them to the floss patients, introduced them to the dental students. And uh, they just heard what a positive experience this was, not only for the patients, as you are totally changing their self-image and their outlook, but also to the dental student who had a chance to see they were developing a skill set that could turn a person's life completely around. I mean, we literally had stories about individuals who are going to commit suicide until they had an opportunity to have their oral health uh, needs addressed. And they did it. And one lady, she is uh, an administrative assistant for the D or for the the mayor's office uh, of Salt Lake County. Uh, I mean, they got these high-profile jobs. They were trained people, but they had gotten into drug problems, and and they just drifted away from their skill sets. And now, now that you've restored the mouth, you've given them self-confidence. You've given them a good quality of life. They feel like they have the energy to address the drug abuse issues and they can put that life back together again. So it's been a very powerful lesson to our students that this is a place where you can really make a difference in people's lives. It's some very interesting data you have there. The, the chart is a uh, first step house self-declared, uh, self-declared males methodology outcome. Um, it, it, doesn't seem like this is a uh, very easy research at all. Um, so tell us about the journey you you've um, you're on your 12th edition of drugs and society. I mean, what a commitment. I mean, w when did the first edition come out and will there be a 13th edition? Can we make news on dentistry uncensored by announcing <laughs> the 13th edition? <laughs> uh, well, there will be another edition. We're working on that now, but I started working with uh, Jones and Bartlett as the publisher, and this is around 1990. So we're almost into the 30th year of this. Uh, and uh, it, it turned out, so I, I, was in, I was in the field. I've been working in drug abuse, the neurobiology. Wasn't doing much with dentistry because we didn't have a dental school at the university at that time. So I was in the College of Pharmacy and the School of Medicine in, in those days. Uh, but I got a chance to do this book and it worked so well. It was so well uh, received that we just kept doing the next edition and the next edition and the next edition. And, and it sells about 20,000 copies a year. Uh, and uh, it is used uh, to, by two to 300 universities across the country as their uh, principal text in drug abuse and drug abuse in society. So it, it, in a way, it became a, a, uh, an exercise of really immersing myself in all aspects of drug abuse. Because as a scientist, the only thing I did was I injected rats, I extracted or I took out their brains, and I did neurochemistry and genetic analysis and looked at the effects of drug abuse. Working with this book and then later going back to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, I had a chance to really see 
how drug abuse and society interacted in its many, many aspects, the public health piece. And that really set me up for coming back into the dental school and saying, uh, you know, I can bring these two things together. I can bring my background in drug abuse and my dentistry. And that's how we got to the paper that we just talked about, where we see there is a connection for dentistry as we try to deal with these other chronic diseases, such as substance use uh, disorder. And now we're trying to sort out why. You know, what is happening here when you take care of a person's oral health that makes their ability to deal with diseases like SUD much more effective and the outcomes to become more positive? And we should, as dentists, oral health providers, we should be sitting at the table with the other health providers, wellness providers, talking about strategies, talking about uh, partnerships, talking about putting our skill sets together in order to provide better comprehensive outcomes for our patients. So how um, is this, how is this message being delivered to the new dental students? Or um, it's a new generation, we always hear how different the millennials are than um, the, the earlier generations like the boomers. Um, is, is this, how is this, uh, is this pretty a complicated message to uh, teach them? It's not that complicated because we, one, we have a really good example in substance use disorder, which is an in your face thing. Nobody uh, questions that, is this a problem? Is it not a problem? Cause there's so many aspects of it where it is a problem. And then we can take that as an example of an underserved population that has major oral health uh, challenges and bring them into our dental clinic, which is sort of controlled. Uh, we have our, our uh, attendings, we have our students, and then we have our didactic instruction where we can kind of fill in gaps, what they're not learning in clinic, they can learn in the classroom and vice versa. And so they can see a comprehensive approach to introducing them and their skill sets to what it is they're going to become or want to become when they walk out of uh, the School of Dentistry here at the University of Utah with their DDS degree and they put together a practice. What do I want to look like? Do I want to be working in, in Hollywood and working on movie stars for my entire career, which was kind of my ambition when I came out of UCLA because <laughs> UCLA was right up there. And I actually, uh, as a student worked on a lot of movie stars, not the big ones, but I had a lot of movie stars. I thought, Hey, this is my idea of a practice, but I didn't ever work on these patients, the under uh, underserved patients. I didn't ever get that exposure. We're giving that to our students. And now they walk out and they say, I've got a role to play out here. I mean, they want to make a living. Okay. Totally understand that. But they also have a skill set that can turn people's lives around in a way that they never quite understood before. So they see it real life. They see it. And you can't teach better lessons than real life. So when you, um, <clears throat> you guys are very um, cerebral. I mean, you have a DDS PhD, the Dean Wyatt Roy Hume has a DDS PhD. When you guys decided to uh, start a dental school in 2013, um, did you guys feel there was a need for a new dental school or that you wanted some unique selling proposition? In, in a country with so many dental schools, what was the impetus to want to start a new school? I think he hit it right on the nail, right on the head. We felt that there was something different that we could do with this one. Just because of the link with uh, the rest of the university, we were embraced by uh, the medical school, and pharmacy and nursing and the other health professionals because they felt there was a role for dentistry to, to play. And quite frankly, their health care system that was being administered by the university had very little dentistry there. We had, we had a residency program, a general practice residency program, but that was it. And they didn't have the experience of dental students interacting with medical students, with pharmacy students and nursing students. And as we went out and tried to create these offsite clinics to care for some of these underserved populations, they were doing the same thing from the medical side. And so we partnered and we put clinics together as a partnership instead of 
they did theirs and we did ours and, and we would invite them over for Christmas lunch and they would invite us over for Christmas lunch. We lived together in the same building in the same clinic and we worked together. And so this was an opportunity to change and develop a model that we think is actually going to be uh, the future of much of dentistry as we go down this road. They, they call it, uh, they call it uh, uh, bonding or blending, where you blend the different services in a way that makes sense for wellness, but also make fiscal sense. You know, if, if you talk to Medicaid or you talk to Medicare or you talk to some of the insurance providers these days, uh, they are trying to find ways to, to blend together uh, comprehensive care rather than, let's say, a, a, a cancer patient. We know that we're going to be treating them. They know, we know they have oral health problems. And so oftentimes the cancer center will send them to a dentist and say, go to your dentist have your dentist take care of all this and then come back and we'll start the uh, cancer treatment on you rather than sitting down with the dentist and saying, okay, we're treating this cancer. These are our concerns. Uh, tell us what you think in terms of the oral health piece. What do we need to keep in mind as we radiate or we do surgery uh, or we give chemotherapy? What sort of oral issues should we be mindful of? And so the dentist is right there with them all the way through this treatment and it's a patient that's the winner at the end of the day so if you if you go to an insurance company and say we provide comprehensive care for this this cancer patient and it includes all of these things that are important for wellness the price tag will be this whatever that price tag happens to be but it covers all of these and it makes the providers blend and think uh, we, as the dentists, we know they're on chemotherapy. We know it's going to compromise their immune system. We know that their pain uh, management is going to look different. We know their nutrition is going to look different. So that informs us so we can provide uh, better dentistry for them and vice versa. The patient's the winner. Um, the United States has a rich history in dental education. I mean, the first, the world's first dental school uh, was in Bainbridge, Ohio in uh, 1828. Now it's a dental museum. The first dental college in the world was Baltimore College of Dental Surgery in 1840. So now it's 2020 when we're supposed to all be seeing uh, more clearly now in 2020. <laughs> and yet Medicaid, um, Medicaid and Medicare uh, dentistry, it, it's not even part of the human body. I mean, um, do you think the dental schools... Um, it's time that maybe the DDS and DMD degree should go back to the MD degree and they should get on the same train track or is a from 1828 to 2020. I mean, it's, it's almost 200 years, right. 200 years of dentists being on one track. The United States has 211,000 Americans have an active license to practice dentistry and over a million have an MD degree. Um, do you think these two trains will ever get on the same track? I think they I think they will and I think that they are. I don't know that it's necessary to think of ourselves as the physicians of the mouth. I mean, I have no particular argument against it, but I think that it's important that our uh, dental students be trained how to do clinical dentistry. Uh, I'm a little nervous uh, if you feel, if there are those who feel that well, we'll let the residency programs teach them the clinical dentistry piece of this. And their undergraduate, we will teach them the medicine, the physician piece of it. I, I don't think we're there, and I'm not sure that we even need to go there. Do we need to give our students an excellent background in, in basic sciences and in pathology and in diseases and in pharmacology? Yes, I think we do because it's important, as important to us to understand the effects of pathology and disease and pharmacology in the mouth as it is to an internal medicine doc or an ophthalmologist uh, or any other professional or uh, specialist. But having said that, I don't know that we need to be training our dentists how to give cancer therapy 
or need to be training them how to do a surgery and remove a gallbladder. I'm not sure that's necessary. I, I think the dental skills we give them, clinical dental skills, are sufficient and, and worthy of being included in the big discussion of the overall health uh, of the patient. I think that what we need to be doing is one, work closely and not be afraid of being part of comprehensive health discussions. But I think we also need to show that when we decide is dental ever going to be a part of Medicare, that we can come to the table, hopefully with papers like what we've done and others will do and say, do you know what the literature says? It says, if we can provide comprehensive dental care to these Medicare patients and they have substance use disorder, their response to treatment for the SUD is gonna be dramatically improved. I personally believe that you'll see the same connection between comprehensive dental care and prediabetes, comprehensive dental care and Alzheimer's disease, comprehensive dental care and cardiovascular disease, I think if you can give these patients that have these serious, major, chronic diseases good oral health so that they have good nutrition, so that they feel good about themselves, so that they feel they have contributions to make still, we call it quality of life, you give them a good quality of life through their oral health, that you'll have a dramatic impact on the rest of their health. And so we go to Medicare and we say, this is what we're bringing. We're going to save you money on all these other diseases because they're going to get better faster and you're going to slow down the deterioration that caused by the disease. So we're going to save you money. And even more importantly, we're going to help preserve and lengthen the health that your patients can have. I mean, we, if we have the evidence, we have that discussion, guess what? We'll be part of Medicare. We are part of Medicaid, but that varies from state to state. So each state makes a determination. In our state, the dental school, the FLOSS program, but other pieces went up to the Medicaid. And not only did we get our Medicaid program, both at the state and the federal level, not only did we get them to extend uh, coverage, dental coverage to Medicaid SUD patients, but we also got them to expand comprehensive dental care for patients that have disabilities, so disabled patients. So these are people that have diabetes, they have degenerative diseases, they can't work as a general rule. And this year, they have extended it to the elderly Medicaid. So our elderly in the state of Utah get comprehensive dental care as part of their Medicaid package. You look at those together, that's almost half of the Medicaid adult population in the state of Utah get the very best dental coverage through the Medicaid program. Other states can do the same thing. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm so glad you came on the show today. This was so informative. I've been wanting to get you on for so long. Um, this was just amazing. Dr. Glenn R. Hansen, DDS, PhD, Professor and Dean, University of Utah School of Dentistry. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you, Howard. It was a pleasure. Have a great day. Take care.